Good morning, Emmaus family and friends. Indeed, on this Sunday morning, we rise together to declare that indeed this is the day that the Lord has made. We choose to rejoice and be glad in it. As we continue in worship and praise, I invite you to turn your Bibles or your electronic Bibles to a familiar text in the book of Nehemiah. We're in chapter number four and in this fourth week of our series, Nehemiah chapter four, verse six and verse 10. I'd like to read for your hearing the New Revised Standard Version, and it reads as follows. So we rebuilt the wall. And all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. But Judah said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, and there is too much rubbish so that we are unable to work on the wall. Today, I would like for you to consider a guiding thought, a theme or a title today of remove the rubbish, remove the rubbish. Please pray with me and pray for me. Dear God, I thank you for an opportunity to shepherd and to handle your most holy word. I thank you, Lord God, for the insight, the study that has brought this word to fruition. I pray even now, Lord God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would breathe afresh and anew upon this word, that it might come alive to minister grace, hope, and healing to all of us who gather to hear. I pray, Lord God, that you would be glorified in this moment, Lord God, and that your people will be empowered to run on to see what the next step should be. Give us the courage, Lord God, and the strength to do the work that removing the rubbish requires. I pray even now, God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. You are our strength and our redeemer and our soon returning King. In Jesus' name, amen. So what you're supposed to do? When only one police officer is convicted in the murder of Breonna Taylor and he was only charged with nearly harming a neighbor and not actually convicted of killing an innocent woman. What's your next move when it becomes clear that democracy is dying at the hands of capitalistic greed and moral disregard? How do you respond to your non-African American or non-brown friends and neighbors who don't understand the weight and the worry that you carry around as a person of color who is randomly and regularly subjective to search, humiliation, and possibly death? What do you do when you faithfully serve on the front line as an essential worker, when people refuse to wear masks to protect themselves and you? What do you do when you discover that your neighbor doesn't really think that your or your child's life really matters? How do you create self-care when you're being asked to parent and to work and to educate all from your kitchen table? What do you do when you're struggling with anxiety or apathy or worry? How do you properly honor Latino, Latina heritage and future when doctors at the borders are illegally sterilizing women and girls so that procreation of the race is not an option? What do we do when the wicked won't seem to cease from troubling? How do we respond when we are underemployed, furloughed, and fired? What do we do when we are isolated and lonely and alone? What is our next move when the occupant of the Oval Office is determined to replace the vacant Supreme Court justice seat faster than he's ever responded to a virus that has already killed over 200,000 people? What do we do when our associates are myopic voters who vote only considering one issue like abortion without any regard for the other human rights and values that are being violated? What is our response when not much seems to make sense? When budget is being stretched and your nerves are being stepped upon, when food is becoming scarce and you're getting scared, when darkness and depression are about to overtake you, what do you do when life and livelihood seems to be in ruins, bent, broken, bashed, bleak, busted, and beat down? Do we give up? Do we allow bitterness to corrupt our spirit? Do we become like Job's wife and decide that we ought to curse God and die? Do we pull away from the fellowship of the local community of faith called the church? 
Absolutely not. We don't stop, beloved. Instead, we start. We don't give in. We push onward and upward. We do the work. We commit ourselves to doing whatever is necessary. And that is what the prophet Nehemiah reminds us in this text in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 10. It says this, so we rebuilt the wall and all the wall was joined together to half its height for the people had a mind to work. But Judah said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing and there's so much rubbish. So we are unable to work on the wall. See, beloved, the book of Nehemiah, as we have been studying, is full of counterintuitive moves. Instead of hurrying up to repair the wall, Nehemiah chooses to observe Sabbath and rest first. Instead of hastily going and to make another request of the king, Nehemiah decides to be strategic and waits for a while. Instead of broadcasting his plans to everyone, Nehemiah restrains his tongue. Instead of bemoaning the night, Nehemiah restrains respected the night and all of her treasures. Instead of relying on those in religious power, Nehemiah chose to gather those who were the community. Instead of solely focusing on me, Nehemiah tells us we rather should focus on the we. Beloved, we need to be a lot like Nehemiah and make up in our minds to do the work to work on our perspective, to work on our prayers, to work on our perception, to work on our persistence, to work on our praise. And that is why I suggested last week that we need to first commit to make up our mind, to make up our mind that we were going to live and not die. We were going to move onward and upward, to make up in our mind that we would and we could make a difference, to make up in our mind that the world can and should be different than what we are experiencing, to make up in our mind that we're going going to be stronger and better and wiser. Yes, we first have to make up our mind. That's what Nehemiah said. And then I suggested that we don't just need to make up our mind with intention. We need to transform our minds, perfect our minds, renew our minds so that we can think new and creative thoughts. And I suggested that we could do this through journaling, through writing down um, our daily concerns and through prayer. And the last thing I suggested, I begged, I beseech, I just threw it out there, hoping y'all would catch the vision, is that we need to fast, which we began on Friday and will continue for 40 days until Election Day. Beloved, can I just tell you all, please don't let a hamburger cheat you from experiencing a breakthrough. Stay on the fast. Please don't let laziness or malaise rob you of the miracle that you desperately need. Stay on the fast. Please don't run from the discipline that is required and will help you to become a better disciple. Refuse to deny the sacrifice because you are fixated on sugar. Friends, insight is released when we have intentionality. We have to make up our minds, transform our minds, and do the work. And for us, the call is to fast. So if you haven't done so already, can I beg you, can I beseech you, please join us on the fast. Do something. Do what you can. Don't limit what you can't. Do the part that you can. There are options and there are choices so that everyone can get in. And then be consistent in prayer. Meet us every Every morning at seven o'clock on the prayer line, as we cry out to God, as we lament to God, as we are filled with the power of the spirit to endure the day. Beloved, the first calling is to do the work. And we must do the work, beloved, because we are actually co-creators with God. We are partners in manifesting the realm or the dream of God. We play a crucial role in our own deliverance. Our vote and our voices lead the way to our victory. Our discipline will empower us to defeat all that is devilish. We have to make up in our minds. It's verse number six, chapter four says to do the work. But if you keep reading, especially verse number 10, Nehemiah finds out something else. That even on the journey toward rebuilding and repairing our lives, we will have to deal with the rubbish. Which is why I call this sermon, Remove the Rubbish. 
See, ruins can only become a renovation when we deal with our junk, our stuff, our rubbish. We cannot ignore the past. We cannot dismiss the pain. We must not minimize the mess. Restoration follows the removal of the rubbish. Revival requires us to face the pieces. If we don't, it will wear us out and slow us down. That's what happened with Nehemiah and his friends. They started out, verse number six, the scripture says they had a mind to do the work. They were purpose and poised to make things happen. But somewhere in there, as they began to rebuild the wall, to reclaim their identity, to try to make things understandable again, they began to build the wall. And as they began to build the wall, there were a lot of stones and rubbish and burnt things in the way. And they began to haul them away. And the scripture says they were working and they got tired of the rubbish. And they declared that we can't work no more. We can't work like this. It's too much, too much rubbish. We're going to have to stop building the wall. They were just halfway there, friends. They stopped because they weren't really willing to deal with the rubbish. They thought it should be easy selling. I'd have made up my mind. I'm going to do right. I may even fast and pray. But listen, I'm not trying to deal with the rubbish in my life. I want my life to be better, but this is all I'm going to do. I'm only going to do half of the work. And Nehemiah says, oh, no, no, no. You got to deal with the rubbish if you want to complete the building. And beloved, I just want to say this. I think that is one of the reasons why the United States is in such a downward spiral. There is this refusal to acknowledge the racial rubbish that is woven into the fabric of our history. There's a resistance to accountability and acknowledgement of complicity. There's an inability or an unwillingness to accept responsibility. There is a deep refusal to think differently about human worth, diversity, and morality. So when faced with the undeniable reality of the complexity of racial relationships and the complicity of religion, the ignorance of the privileged, the understandable frustration of communities of color and immigrants, the reckless brutality of far too many police officers, the inequity of available resources for families during this remote learning and sheltering in place, when faced with all these undeniable realities, the current leadership team simply quits the conversation, choosing instead to blame, to shame, or play golf. Instead of actually dealing with the rubbish directly, systematically, and sincerely. Yes, beloved, the United States of America halts in the face of rubbish. Declare, ooh, that's too hard. Those conversations are too hard. We don't really want to lift that. We don't really want to face that. Scurrying back to the false facade of liberty and justice for all. Hiding behind allegiance to a flag when it's really an allegiance to ill-gotten wealth at any cost. Our souls are shrinking and people are dying by the hundreds of thousands because of our unwillingness to deal with the rubbish. But followers of Jesus must think and act differently. We must be committed to actually dealing with and removing the rubbish so that we can all move onward and upward, so we will not be daunted by the difficult, so we will not be halted by the historically horrible. No, beloved, it will not always be a delightful or easy or smooth journey. It will take determination, discipline, dedication, and devotion. In fact, the trash or the discarded parts of our lives will often slow our growth down until we dare to attend to it. You wonder why you can't get to the next level? It's because you're dragging all this rubbish with you. You've been impeded by the things that have been burnt down before you. So we must pick them up and put them where they belong. No one gets a pass for not dealing with the rubbish or the rubble. It's part of the process. And that is what happens when we make a commitment to fast and pray. 
When we fast and pray, we position ourselves for God to show us things, to show us interpretation and perspectives on the things that are holding us back and holding us bound. When bound, when we fast and pray, the Spirit will reveal stuff to us, give us creativity and loose understanding to solve our problems. When we fast and pray, Jesus speaks afresh and anew when we dare to remove the rubbish, all the things that impedes our forward movement. Maybe we could get to where we desire, long and love to be if we would deal with the rubbish that's all around us and not be hindered by the work. Friends, when our lives are in ruins, we will have to face the rubbish or the rubble. If we want a healthy and whole and healed marriage, we can't overlook the offense and the infidelity. We have to pick up the rubbish and deal with it. If we truly and deeply desire intimacy, we will have to engage in honesty and transparency and transparency about the tragedy that we have endured. If we long for success or promotion or forward movement in our careers, we have to face the idiots and crazies that have hindered us and hampered us thus far. We have to deal with the rubbish. We can't ignore it because it slows us down. If we actually believe we are equipped by God or called by God for a purpose, we must boldly walk toward that destination, even if our friends don't understand, even if we don't personally think we are worthy. We are more ready than we ever realize. Friends, we simply can't avoid the hard stuff, the hard parts, the hard conversations. We must face the harsh realities about ourselves and about others. We must engage the unlovely and the hidden and the unpopular. Friends, it's very simple. It works when we actually work it. And I declare, I believe it'll be worth it that 40 days out when we get to the election, we will be positioned and poised with spiritual power and authority. It's going to be worth it. Don't give up this moment and this opportunity to partner with God in the healing of the land. Friends, I believe that this moment, this season in American history can still be redeemed in the midst of and in spite of all the chaos and craziness that's swirling around us. We can turn this current trajectory around. We actually can become one nation under God. But we got to deal with the rubbish and its sources, and its supporters, the things and the people and the practices that got us here, the folks that assaulted our identity and crashed down the wall. We got to deal with that. We got to really actually deal with and face privilege and power and white supremacist ideology and those benefits, including duplicity of law that even allows a convicted criminal to choose her own prison. What is that about? We got to come face to face and question the Republican version of Christianity, which is often very different from the classical Christianity that Jesus taught. We must deal with it in the public sector and we have to deal with it in our private lives. When we dare to fast and pray, we position ourselves to deal with our own stuff. We become empowered so we don't give up or give in too prematurely and stop moving altogether and say, well, I had a mind to work, but I don't have the energy to see it through. That's what fasting and prayer does. It gives us the energy to see it through, to not be overcome or overrun by the hindrances or the old stuff in our life. And I know you may be asking and saying, well, Reverend, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm good. I don't need to fast or pray. I don't have much rubbish in my life. I'm pretty good. My mind's made up. I'm good. But oh, before you judge your situation too quickly, maybe I should define what this rubbish could be in our lives. Sometimes the rubbish is disguised as defeats. Things that we wanted to go one way, but we were crushed by external things, things outside of us. That's what happened to the people in Nehemiah's day. There were outsiders who came and literally and burnt down the walls and demolished the bridges, and they simply were defeated. And because they were defeated, they looked at the broken ruins of their life. There are things that literally come against us, both in the spirit realm and in the natural realm, that come to defeat us. You all remember the story of Esther in the Bible in the First Testament? 
her whole people were about to be annihilated. And she had to go before the king to try to get someone to intervene so they wouldn't be defeated. There are forces out there gathering to defeat a whole group of people, if not groups of people. Old defeats will cause you to have rubbish. Disappointment and dashed dreams can cause the pieces of your life to be broken at your feet. Defeats, disappointment, dashed dreams, detours, delays, disappointments, all of those things can become rubbish or baggage that hinder you from moving forward. But when we decide to fast, fasting reorients us and puts us back on the path. Fasting redirects us. Fasting is like a spiritual GPS that reroutes us back to purpose and to passion. So we don't give up too soon before our task assignment is completed. When we fast, we understand the um, truth of distractions that are sent our way to slow us down so we don't complete what God is calling us to do. I was reading this amazing story, which I could not believe myself, uh, of, of a Catholic priest who recently discovered that he was not ordained. He had been practicing ministry nearly 30 years. The way he discovered that he was not ordained is because he watched his baptismal video from years ago. And the deacon, the story is told, the deacon who baptized him said one wrong word in the baptism. Instead of saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the guy in charge over 30 years ago said, we baptize you. And because he understood his baptism not to be valid because of one word, then that means he was not a Christian in his mind. And if he was not a Christian, then he couldn't be a priest. Right. And if he couldn't be a priest, why would he need to be ordained? So all the good work that he had done for nearly three decades immediately invalidated because in his mind, he said that one word was not the right word. Beloved, some of us have a religious experience like that. When one little thing's not right, we invalidate all the things that God has done. We stop moving forward. We stop in our path. All the good work of decades because of one misspoken word. Well, some would even suggest was not misspoken at all. Beloved, do not be delayed or distracted by the rubbish that comes up to you or presented for you. So you are stopped doing the work of the Lord. I think that little story is instructive for those of us who are trying to rescue the ruins of our own life. I believe we do need to shift from the I language to the we language. We need to harness community. We need to stop thinking so much about our individual needs and we need to move forward with a corporate identity. We are in this thing together. And beloved, I am convinced that if we dare to deal with the rubbish long enough, if we dare to face our own truth and the truth of our country, we will not just see rubbish we will find remnants stuff that we need to pick back up and to reclaim the ruins will become renovations when we change our minds when we decide to do the work when we get new insight on our situation our circumstance and our season if we dare to go through the rubbish of our lives I believe that revival will be loose that God will speak afresh and anew to remind us not to be distracted by the side conversations make the real thing the real thing When we decide to fast and to pray and dig through the rubbish, it will remove the holdups, the hindrances, and the hangups in our lives. It will position us for a new identity. Remember, Jesus says that on this rock, he will build the church. He will build the church on those of us who decide to stand. Isn't that some good news? That Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Jesus holds this whole thing together. If we will align ourselves with Jesus Christ, with the God of creation, God, God self can rebuild the very kingdom of the realm of God in this present day. Won't you line up with God through fasting and prayer? Won't you dare to dig through the rubbish? Won't you be brave enough to read through all of the crazy in your life so that we all can move onward and upward? And if Jesus is a rock, like he said, in the weary land, the saints said, if Jesus indeed is help in the time of trouble, if he's indeed a wheel in the middle of a wheel, the bright and morning star accompanied 
keeper and a mind regulator, a healer of the way, the truth and the light, then we align up with God, building up God's kingdom. Then we indeed by proxy are more than conquerors. The greater is he that is in us and he is in the world. We will and can be victorious and we can issue up revival instead of ruins. Emmaus family and friends fast like your life depends on it because it does. Let the fast continue. And if you haven't started, let the fast begin. This moment in time demands that we work and worship, protest and pray, be bold and be brave. Beloved, ruins and rubbish will not have the final word. Why? Because we've made up in our mind and we are willing to do the work, even if it requires us going through the rubble and the rubbish of our personal lives in our community. We are the people for this hour and for this moment. The sixth lesson from the book of Nehemiah, remove the rubbish. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.